Hi folks and uh, welcome to the live stream. We'll just hang on a couple of minutes. Um, I'm maybe a little early. If you can hear me loud and clear, please let me know and uh, we'll crack on once a few more people have joined the party. Hello Mick, how are you? I hope you've had a good Christmas and New Year. Looking forward to the new season ahead. Can, Can we, we just get a, a thumbs up? Sound is echoey. Hmm. I think I might be able to fix that. I think it's because I've got two mics on the go, so I'm going to silence that one. How's that now, Mick? Does that sound better? Hi, Tom. I'm very well, thank you. We still got a bit of an echo, have we? Ah, excellent. I know what I've done wrong. I'm just going to switch to the fly time camera and uh, cancel out the other mic. And hopefully, we're in business. Now, I'm hoping the sound's much better. Um, I maybe should have hooked up a better sound system. I've not done a live stream for a long time, so I'm hoping that it's going to go okay. Now, uh, I've not done much of anything for a long time, if I'm honest. The last time I went fishing was the Hanak Grayland Festival. And due to bad weather, I've just not been able to get out fishing, which has uh, almost broke me at times. Thank God I've got a dog, is all, all I can say. Uh, that's managed to get me out outside quite a bit. So what I want to do today is we'll talk a little bit about grayling fishing and I'm going to tie a few flies hopefully and uh, they're, they're some of my personal favourites, not all of them, the one at the end if I've got some time is a kind of an experiment we'll say but um, I'm pretty sure the point of tying the fly is something I'll come on to later. So uh, thanks very much for tuning in. There's a, there's several people on now, and I'm glad the sounds improved. Uh, what was happening is I had two mics running, and it was just causing that feedback loop. Hopefully, the sounds um, decent now. So I'm going to crack straight on with the first fly. And if uh, my life depended on it, and I had to just take one fly to the river, and was forced to catch a fish, this would be the fly. So I'm just going to switch over. To the vice and what you see in this vice is a, what's called a Mary nymph. Now I have tied it on the channel before um, and it's basically a modified pheasant tail. Now I believe uh, the pattern originated from a lad called Simon Robinson who um, has represented England more times than you can shake a stick at and he came up with this fly the Mary Nymph, and I do believe that he did marry that young lady in the end, so uh, it's be, it was a good call. And I got into grayling fishing, I'll just switch back actually, I got into grayling fishing as a way of filling out the winter months while I was waiting on the lock style season starting up again, and the friend that got me into it, uh, sadly he's no longer with us, but um, he, he got me into it, and then he got me into the competition side of it, and then it grew arms and legs, you know how it goes. Uh, and I fell right down the rabbit hole with it and uh, in love with it, uh, I might say. I, I love river fishing. It's really, I don't know, I wouldn't say spiritual, but, you know, if you want to go away and you're wandering down a river bank, you can take your mind off all life's worries. So let's switch back to the vice and we'll get on with this fly. So the Mary Nymph, uh, there it is in all its glory. Now, this is a size 16 and I thought... Um, I would start with a 16 because and I do tie them down to size 20, believe it or not. But a size 16 uh, is what we're going to use today because it's just easier for demonstration purposes. Now I have got a little pad with my intended flies and I'm looking for the Marion F1. Here it is. 
just bear with me. I'll pop this in the vise. Now, obviously, uh, I'm just in here on my lonesome. And while I'm tying the flies, and even while I'm uh, switching between speaking to you and tying the flies, it doesn't give me much time to read the comments. So if you've got a question, please bear with me and I will come on to it. So we'll start with the Mary Nymph. And what I have in the vise is a Hanak H260 barbless hook. And as you can see, this one's at size 16. It's on a heavy wire and it's finished in black nickel. Now I haven't got the packet, but it's a 2.3 millimeter tungsten bead copper. And I'm going to be using for this pattern, and this is the only uh, time I'll be using anything other than black, is the brown nano silk at 12 watt. As always, if you've watched any of the videos, uh, you'll be sick of seeing this terrible brush. Uh, it definitely needs renewing, and when I get to get to the BFFI next month, I'll certainly be looking to purchase some new super glue. But needs must, uh, and I'm not a wasteful person. Uh, it's getting kept until it's used up. So I've just caught in a bump in behind the bead. Now, I don't like the bead shifting up and down the hook while I'm tying, so I always do this when I'm tying beaded flies. Now I'm going to come down the shank just before I finish I'm going to trim my thread away there so that I can get a nice neat finish towards the end of the hook. Now, first thing I'm going to capture in is um, some Coq de Leon. <clears throat> now, these are lovely feathers. They're really light and you'll see they're barred, which uh, I like. And what I want to take from the edge here is three. If you get four, don't worry about it. You know, the fish can't count, last I checked. And I want it not quite as long as the length of the shank of the hook. So I'm going to pull that in slightly. And then I can just tie it in. I'm just holding the ends just to keep it on the top of the shank. And I can come in with my scissors, excuse my fingers, and remove that. Now for the the rib, I use a copper rib. Now you can play about with this pattern, and I have done over the years, but I always return to the original. Um, it just seems to work really well. So it's a 0.2 millimeter copper rib, and I'm going to catch that in along the entire length of the body. Uh, just come back there, I want it to catch on my side. And then I can come down all the way to the base of the fly. Okay, so it's a pheasant tail body. And uh, again, I've tried it in black. Black works very well, actually. But today I'm going to tie it as I found it all those years ago. In fact, for many years, this is about all I would fish for Graylin. It was just so effective. But obviously, you know, you go fishing with other people and uh, you start picking up new things. So I'll just get a couple of extra wraps in behind the bead there. And then I'll come in with my hackle pliers and grab the edges. So I trust you've all had a, a good Christmas and New Year. It was very quiet. Um, I think the country, uh, and I'm, I'm speaking from the UK here, suffered terrible rain. I mean, it was absolutely shocking. And I did venture down to the River Test for a day's fishing with a couple of pals. And we ended up having a barbecue by the riverbank and then just getting back in our cars and heading home. It was, uh, the river was mighty high and it was pushing through. So we didn't bother, which was a shame because that would have been probably one of my few chances to get out during the holidays. So it's come around, I'm going to catch that pheasant tail in, both behind and in front. And then when I come in with my scissors to take away the excess, oh, I've just got a, a little fibres come away there. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. I'll just grab it and pull it away. Then with my wire rib, I'll come around. 
and I want to have about three turns of this wire rib showing. So that'll just about do it and then I can come onto the thorax area and get another couple of turns. Now I'm not overly worried about getting extra turns in at the front here, just adds a little bit to the weight which is ideal. And once I've trapped that in I can just helicopter that away. Now the next thing then is I'm going to use some uh, mirror tinsel. This is at 0 0.8 millimeters. Uh, if I can just get the end. Bear with me. I'll just take that off and before I catch this in, I'm just going to add a little bit of wax to the nano silk and it just helps grip this quite slidey material. So I'll hand that. And now just a tip here, when you're tying in your thorax covers like this, some people try and tie, I've seen other instructors saying, oh, you put it on top and then, but they're not actually putting it on top. What they're doing is they're putting it just towards themselves. And then when they bring the thread wrap over, it's just twisting it on top. It's not much, it's a very subtle thing and you might you might miss it sometimes when you're, you're watching these videos. So I've caught that in. And the next thing I want to do is add my dubbing, which I did have a tiny little amount out. Now it's simply, uh, this is Andrew's scruffy dubbing, it's natural boosted. Uh, it's it's minuscule, the amount, that's why I could barely see it on my vice. But um, there we go. In fact, I, I still think I've maybe got too much dubbing here, but we'll see how we get on. So we'll come in with this. And what I can do is trap in the thorax cover. Now what I do with this is it's a couple of turns over the top of the, the mirror tinsel, then pull it back, get a couple of turns in front, and then you can simply cut it away. Don't cut it too neat though, because when we come into whip finish, which we'll be doing in a second, you don't want to pull it too tight and then that pops your cover. So I'm just going to add some super glue to my thread. And then I'm able to come in with a whip finisher. Oh, and it's just snapped away. But the super glue will hold that in place. And there we go. Size 16, Mary Nymph. Now, sometimes I'll twe tweeze out the, uh, the dub in, other times I'll just leave it as is. And as I'm sure you're all aware, this is an absolutely excellent fly for the duo. It's, it's almost tailor-made for the duo, and that's how I do a lot of my fishing, uh, especially on the smaller chalk streams. So I'm just going to have a look at the comments. Bear with me. Sunday morning, bumped a fish off, but was nice to be out. Yeah, it's always nice to be out, Mick, definitely. New to me, the grayling, but always interested in new flies and materials. All the best, Dundee. Ah, you've got some nice rivers up there, Douglas. I, I dare say you would probably get someone to take you out and uh, show you the ropes. Grayling fishing. Are grayling in England wild or stocked? Well, that's a good question. I think uh, not 10 years ago, grayling were looked at as a pest and they were thrown up the bank by a lot of keepers. Maybe a bit longer than that. Certainly when I started grayling fishing, I always remember being invited along to um, a colleague at work owned a section of river. And uh, it was where Brightwater's meet, actually. And he said, oh, you know, you can come and fish and blah, 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 blah. And he said, any of them grayling you get, make sure you throw them up the bank. They're taking all the food from the brown trout, which is obviously absolute twirl. Um, the grayling are in there for a reason and it speaks volumes to the quality of the water. If you've got grayling in your river, you've got a mighty healthy river. So, um, yeah, they are all wild. I don't believe they're stocked. I think some places now are trying to reintroduce grayling. So they may be stocked. But 
Uh, I'm not sure. It depends on your locality. Welsh D at a decent level at the moment. Yeah, Dylan, uh, I've seen your photographs, actually. Uh, looks like you're having a great time down there. The D's a, a fabulous river, and we were so lucky to have it in prime form for the Hanak International Festival. It, it fished really well. Conditions couldn't be any better, but, you know, straight after that, certainly around Maui, conditions got terrible, and all through the rest of the month of December, right through Christmas, um, the rivers by me were just unfishable. And I'm at the point now where... I'm going to have to travel a few hours if I'm going to get any kind of grayling fishing in and uh, try and salvage a little bit of the season. Scott, grayling are the easiest fish you'll ever find to catch. They're very obliging. Uh, unlike trout, they're happy for you to, to stand over them pretty much in most places. Um, yeah, they're the most obliging fish I've fished for. You just need somebody to show you the ropes, pal, I would think. Anyway, um, so that was the Mary Nymph. Let's have a look at the next one. And uh, some of you might uh, recognise this one. I'll just pop it in the vice. Uh, I don't want any controversy or, you know, that's not what it's called or that it's... I'm not interested, really. Uh, you know, flies are flies to me. I, I don't even bother naming half my flies but this is um one that people tell me is called the grayling slayer now to me it's just another bug but it's obviously um done very well for people over the years now uh it's a very simple fly uh, i've done something slightly different with it and just while i'm waffling here i'll grab the materials for that fly just get rid of some of this stuff out of my way. I'm working in a very small area and uh, it's not particularly easy. So here we go. Right, so let's get a hook in the vise, a sturdy hook in the vise. And I can't find it. Here it is. Okie dokie. So, what I've just put in the vice then is a Hanak 490 Superb. It's a jig trophy. And I've coupled it with, again, the label's gone, but as you can see, it's a copper bead, and this one's at 3.5 millimetres. Now, it's a great fly, you know, there can be no doubt. Call it whatever you like. It, it, it just works. So, again, I'm going to get a little bit of super glue onto the shank of the hook and this time I'm swapping over to what I'll be using for the rest of the evening and it's uh, the 6 aught nano silk and I'm going to use that just to spread the glue make sure your bead comes right up over the the top of the the eye of the hook that's what jig hooks are for And while I'm doing the basic stuff here, uh, I tend to, well, I know, well, I don't tend to. What I use is a 10-foot Hanak Superb for a three-weight. I think it's a, like everything in fishing, it's a compromise between uh, weight, um, playing a big fish, getting the reach with the longer rod, especially when you're Euronymphing. So a lot of people favour the 11-foots for ones and twos. Uh, I, I, t I think you can be in a bit of trouble with bigger fish now. People will tell me, oh, I still land the big fish with the two weights and stuff, and uh, that's great, but I bet it's a struggle in fast water. Anyway, moving on. Um, again, I've got some mirror tinsel, and it's, it's a lot thinner than the one I used for the thorax cover. And I'm going to catch a bit of that off the reel and then I can tie that on I mean the thing about and the, the thing about the the river fishing flies is they're just almost all of them are an easy tie unless you go down the realistic road 
pretty much all the grayling flies are really easy to tie. So the dubbin I'm going to be using is, uh, again, this is a, a custom blend. It's, it's called Lindsay's Killer Shrimp. And uh, it was for, it was blended for me by Andrew for, for shrimp patterns, for Grapham actually. But I found it works very well for this fly. Quite a spiky squirrel dubbin. It's a kind of hybrid. There's some synthetic fibres in there as well. So I'm going to bring that up next. All the way to the head of the fly. Now, the mirror tinsel, it's not particularly robust, so I want to protect that. And how I'm going to do it is with some super glue. And I'll catch that onto the cocktail stick, because as you can see, my brush is foobard. Roll on the BFFI. So I did have uh, another video planned for you, and it was going to be an accessories video, but I'm still waiting on one item coming before I uh, make the video. So in the meantime, I thought it would be nice, as I have got a, a Zoom fly tying demonstration coming up, to just have a little practice and... Uh, do this YouTube live so hopefully it's going okay it's hard to tell when you're you're um, behind the vice so I brought that up the super glue will help adhere it to the body and if you were of a mind to you can come in with your dubbing brush just pick out gently some of them fibers now I think the the grail and slayer that I've seen uh, most people using it's like pure orange really bright orange but i'm using it uh, again uh, andrew kindly done me a custom bag of orange which has a little bit more going for it should have had some out the bag sorry and you don't need very much it's only uh it's only to create a collar so i've got it here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to spread it out and instead of just dubbing it on which would be the quick way of doing it I am going to split my thread. Now, I like doing this a lot. I think, you know, people say it's a waste of time. I think you get a particular effect from creating a dubbing loop that you just don't get by dubbing on your material direct to the thread. So, I'll catch that in there. And then what I'm going to do is spin that up. And then I'll just take away some of the big, bulky, longer strands. There's a purple one in there. I just want to get rid of that. Don't know why. Should it be all right? There we go. And then I can come round. Like so. Now, of course, this can be tied bigger, smaller. Uh, the choice is yours. And... It's very effective for grilling. I mean, I always associate, uh, and we'll see this later on, pink with grilling. I mean, pink, uh, purples, the brighter sort of colours, they tend to, to react to that. And sometimes, I did see, in fact, I think it was Kyle Cheshire was on the other day and he was, he, he wrote a really nice uh, piece on Facebook about a grilling that he caught. And it was a stone confession. He, he spent a long time... Um, tracking the fish trying to catch it and uh, the, the upshot was he threw everything at it pretty much in his box until he put on a squirmy wormy chenille wormy and the thing moved two feet and snaffled it and he caught the fish so you know the thing with grail and what i find and I've, I've had the luxury of being able to watch them in clear chalk stream water is they behave and um, they've got like a collective intelligence if you like well, like the borg so i've watched grayling and show they'll show up in the colder months and so you'll cast and you might catch one and then if you're doing your due diligence you'll target the tail end charlie and then you'll tr start picking up the show but if you've misplaced a cast you might catch one or two even but then it seems that 
they all communicate and your flies will come right through that shoal of grayling. They won't have spooked, they just will not touch your fly. And the secret's often just a change, change of pattern, and uh, you'll immediately get another reaction or at least a, a chance. Now, uh, excuse me a sec, I'm just going to have a wee tipple of this. Cheers. So let's have a look. Any more questions? Hi, John. How are you doing? Hmm. How many grayling would you try to land from one pool? Well, I, 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 that's a good question, John. And it's uh, sorry, Mick. And it's probably different. Now, when when I was still doing the England qualifiers, I would always go to Werewell. And what I would do, rather than um, waste time, a lot of people run about. We've got a strange qualification system here. Um, I don't know if you're aware, but the, the Worlds and the Europeans, they all fish to Fitzmoosh. Um, in England, they fish to IFFA, which pretty much means you, you, you've you got a... a a river and you can go anywhere you like you might have a start and beat on some some of the qualifiers but you can run to wherever you like and if uh, another angler's there you can do what's called a challenge and say i, I want that water and the, the angler's got 30 minutes to fish it out and move uh, why you would want to go in after he's done that it's kind of beyond me uh, why are we running up and down the bank doing a completely different game from uh, phipps moosh that's beyond me as well. You know, it's like it's like the English football team playing five aside for two years and then going to the World Cup to play an eleven side match. It's uh, it's madness. Anyway, sorry, I've digressed. Back to the question. So when I was um, doing these qualification things at Werewell, I would find a shoal of grayling, and I wouldn't move. I'd if my session was three hours, I'd spend three hours on my knees, and I might have moved. I don't know, 20 feet in that three hours, but I would have caught every grayling in the pool by working my way through the flies, reducing in size, sometimes going up in size can make a difference. But uh, I didn't really see the point of running up and down the river um, chasing grayling when I've got a big pod in front of me. And uh, I got to know where well really well, so I knew where to go and I knew what to do. So uh, I suppose the answer to the question is all of them. I'd want all the grayling in that pool. Um, I would only move on. Pleasure days now that I do, I move on because I want to change a scene or a different kind of water. But yeah, I would expect to catch every grayling in the pool if I wanted them. Uh, get on the squirmies. All right. No shit, John. I'm with you. Hi, rolling, rolling, reeling. Um, yeah, that must be a tough gig. Fishing from a wheelchair on some of the river banks we've got here would be tough going. I'm looking forward to the BFFI, Dylan. Tesco Cell Super Glue. Yeah, but it costs money. Come on, Andre. Uh, can be a good fly on the tweed. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, the boy that kind of brought it to fame was uh, a boy called Bill Eady. I don't see much of him nowadays, but uh, I think he was the guy that brought the old Grayland Slayer name, and uh, I think he took a power of abuse for it, actually, but uh, that's another story. Have you ever fished the Annan? It's on my list for next year. I've got a couple of pals, Scott, up that, that live by Edinburgh, and the other one lives in Carlisle, and I think we are going to have a wee go on the Annan. I'm told it's very good, but that'll be for the trout, of course. Virginia, can't say that we have grayling, but I'll stick around for a bit. Well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate that, pal. So, James, I, I did mention earlier, uh, I don't know if you maybe missed it, I was, t I was tying a fly at the time, I... It depends on what method you're using. For um, If I'm fishing dry fly for grayling and you do get 
the very, very odd opportunity to fish dry flies at the, the middle of the day when the sun's at its, its height, you can often get a chance of some dry fly sport. And uh, I would say more so in the months of October, maybe early November, but as the temperatures here have been like minus four, minus five of late, so I wouldn't expect to see much dry fly fishing. But if I was, I would be fishing uh, an eight foot six rod, uh, three weight line, and probably a, a seven to eight foot tapered leader, and then another five foot to my dry fly, or my dual rig if I, I intended to fish dual. Uh, for Euro Nymphin, I mentioned earlier I'm using a Hanak Superb 10 foot for a three, and I think that's a, a happy compromise, if you like, as, as regards to Euro Nymphin. Um, some boys will tell you 11 foot for a two, and nine foot for a two shorter rods are better and it's personal preference you know you've got a you've got a pick your bad i suppose because fly fishing's a compromise you know that there'll always be some better way of doing things uh, and you've got to find your medium thank you for looking at winter when ponds are frozen um, yeah, uh, well, my local fishery, Albury Estates, um, they've got about enough room for 20 anglers now, and it's a huge pond, but it's starting to freeze over. What's the dram this evening? It's a, oh, it's a nicely timed there, Dylan. It's a Lagavulin, 16-year-old. Very nice. It was a Christmas present. Thanks, love, if you're watching. So I think uh, I've addressed all the comments thus far and uh, I'm going to move along to the next fly. And what have I done with the last fly? There it is. Right, go over to the bench again. Now, this fly, uh, I'm told, well, I was told off actually, because I call this the bread and butter fly and uh, the reason for that it's it's my bread and butter grayling fly now it's not coming up very well on my screen so I'm not sure what it'll be like on yours but this is like a powdery pink coloured bead and uh, what it is as I was told off it's a waltz worm so it might be a sexy waltz worm but it's a waltz worm that's I think that's an American term uh, me I just call it a, but it's just a bug it's my, my go to bug so I thought I would share it with you. And this one is tied, if I can get the hook out. I'll tell you why that's going wrong. So I've got it facing the wrong way. So this would be uh, pretty much a point fly for me on a Euro Nymphin rig. Uh, again, it's a very simple fly to tie. And I'm just gonna get that, make sure that's in the vise. Is that sitting right? Yeah, there we go. Okay, so again, where's that stinking brush? We'll get that touch of super glue on. It does make a difference. I don't like the, the body rotating. And again, I'm going to build my thread here to hold my bead in place. Just want it to sit over the eye of the hook. Now, all the beads I've used thus far have been Hanak, but I have got, if I find some time at the end, in fact, I'm not sure how we're doing for time. Goodness, that's 35 minutes already. I don't know where the time goes when I do this. <laughs> anyway, uh, the rib of the fly is some 0 0.2 copper wire. And I've got a little bit here I've been working with. Now what I do with the slotted ones here is I simply tuck them into the slot and then come all the way down the bottom. Oh, I've got the right. That's the wrong dubbing. Sorry, I've got about four different uh, sets of materials lying around my 30 centimetre square bit of bench. 
So I'm using some of this stuff. This is a, again, it's Andrew Scruffy Duffin, Dubbin even. Uh, Boosted Natural. It's, uh, I've been using this for years now and uh, I'm, I'm fast running out and, and Andrew sadly seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. He's got into politics and uh, I, I haven't heard from him or seen, seen anything of him on Facebook or that, where is where you used to be able to get in touch with him and uh, he would blend you up dubbins uh, like this, which uh, are fantastic. Uh, I'm probably just over enthusiastic with the dubbing, but I'm going to go with it. Then I'll take my wire, come over the top. Now, I don't put much stock in there's a killer fly for this and there's a killer fly for that because you've got to be remembering that when you're fishing in a river, that fish has hardly got any time whatsoever to decide whether it's going to take your fly or not. You know, it's bouncing down the bottom. You imagine how, if, you, if you've if you Euronymphed yourself, you know how fast you track them nymphs back. It's got no time at all to inspect the fly. So, you know, does it make any difference? I think size, profile, if you get them two things right, you could tie on whatever kind of dub in or material you like and, and you will still get the same result. Uh, you would get an offer from a fish. So I'm just scruffing that out a bit. And I'm now looking for, aha, there it is. It's secret. I can't tell you this one. Uh, it's a blend that was sent to me a while back and what I used to use before this was just purple but I've started using this uh, and it works a treat. Now unlike the uh, the grayling slayer there where I split the thread this time I'm simply going to dub on a collar. Now this stuff will free out eventually as it as it goes down the stream. So I've got that on there like that. And then once again, by the power of super glue. I've done uh, I've done a few time demonstrations now, uh, which uh, it always makes me smile that anyone would want to sit and watch me and listen to me whittle on about fishing. But, you know, some people find it interesting. Uh, but some of the uh, some of the ones I've been to have, have been quite amusing. Uh, it's like they're going to throw up when they see the pot of super glue coming out, which always makes me smile. But uh, I remember going to one, I'll not name the club, but I went to a club and, uh, you know, I like to have a bit of a laugh and a bit of banter with people. And uh, But the, the audience seemed rather you know, uh, subdued, that's the word I'm looking for, subdued. And uh, during the break, I went up to the, the chairman and I said, uh, oh, is, is it is it okay? Is is everyone happy enough with with the demonstration that I'm doing? And he said, oh, Lindsay, it's, it's amazing. He said, this is the first time everyone stayed awake for one of these demonstrations, which made me chuckle. So this is uh, the fly I've just shown you there. That is my go to for the point. So I would fish this on the point, I would fish a much smaller fly, something like the Mary, or even a squirmy above it. So just take that out of the vise, and then we'll go back to the comments section. If you haven't all gone home yet, let's have a wee looky. Do you process your own feathers and furs? Scott, I don't. I, I, you know, I've had a play about with the dyeing process and uh, I, I watched David McPhail's video on how you, how you dye stuff and I've done some uh, goose bites, I've done some frets, I've done some marabou, but uh, that's not for me. I mean, there's, there's boys much better qualified than me at, at dyeing and preparing materials and uh, I'd rather pay the extra couple of pennies for that to happen.
Um, back to the bodkin, please. The bodkin? <laughs> okay. Your last name's Lindsay. Ah, that's a good name. All the good people have got named Lindsay. Can't beat a bit of scruffy dubbing. No, Paul, it's outstanding. And uh, I think uh, Andrew's absence has pro probably created a demand that he'll be, he'll be busy to the rest of his days if he got back into it. Kerry, you must have fell asleep, and you need your sleep, pal, so get your head down. Are we talking about this bodkin needle, Tom? Or this one? Let me know. Right, okay, I'm just going to have another wee tipple. And then we'll move along. Now, that last fly I tied, I said it was my point fly on my rig. And um, there's various other options, obviously. And I've got uh, an example here. I'm not going to tie it, but I am going to show you a couple of examples of it. Now, when I've got to get really, really deep, uh, I use a couple of different flies, actually, and um, they're not sacrificial. They will catch fish. Um, not often, but they will catch fish. So here's here's one here. I don't know how well you'll see it here. I'll just roll it round in the vise. This one's in construction, shall we say. And basically, I got this idea from an angler called Terry Phillips. Now, you might have heard of him. He's been national champion a couple of times, and he's represented England at World, European. In fact, you name it, he's represented England. Sadly, he's moved away from fly fishing, and he's gone into the coarse fishing world, which is a great loss to us, because the boy was on genius level when it come to catching fish. So, what you see here, basically, it's... Um, a jig back underneath, I've got a tungsten bead on the point, and it's coated in like a carp. I can't quite remember it, I've, lo I've kind of lost the packets actually. But it's to represent a caddis fly, and it will get down really quickly. So I use them on the points if I've got to get some depth. Now, the other thing I often use is Crosstown's caddis, and uh, I don't know... If, I'm sure if, if, if you fish a lot, you'll know who Howard Croston is. Uh, he's been he's a double world champion. He knows what he's on, and he he designed a fly called the Croston Caris. Uh, similar idea to Terry's, only the body was just covered in thread, and it's you can get them up to four grams, which is uh, is all the weight you'll ever need. And you've got to be very careful when you're slinging that kind of tungsten about, or your your rod's going to end up the wrong side of a four piece so uh, be wary of that so the next fly I'm going to tie is a shrimp I'll just put that in the vise and I'll check the comments before I move over good dubbing is hard to find Colin definitely uh, the one you split the thread with. Yeah, this is a... It's a stone flow one, this. Um, now, I think I got it from Uphaven Fly Fishing. Uh, if you go on their website, I think they've got them. I mean, they're cheap as chips. And the other thing they've got on the other end is a... It's like, a, in fact, if I switch cameras, I can show you the other end. Let me... Yeah, it's got a blade on the other end where you can cut thread and that, but I don't use that much. I end up uh, slashing my fingers. But yeah, stone flow, stone flow, um, I don't know, working. PTN for grilling, yeah, works a treat, Scott, works a treat. Yeah, on that one, um, Colin, I have used a gold head, but it works as well with copper. Again, I go back to the point I made earlier about, you know, the flies bouncing past 
these fish, they're getting a split second to decide whether to engulf it. Does the colour of the bead matter? Mm, well, I've got a lot of faith in that powder pink bead, I would say, but other than that, not really. Okay. Basically, I'm looking for a really fine borking needle to split my thread with. Yours looks like the sort of thing I need. Tom, you're right, but I dropped mine, and it's now got a bend in the point, which is a bit of a pain in the arse, if I'm perfectly honest. Okay, copperhead work better for me. Thanks. Shrimps is the fly I want to learn. All right, Scott, well, let's get on with it. Right, so uh, this is a fairly generic sort of shrimp pattern. Let me just grab the gear for it. Um, so I'm going to start with, uh, and I'll just flip back to me. So I'll get that fly out the vise and put in an empty hook. Okay, so basically we've got our um, hook in the vise. And I think I've forgotten the hook. Where is it? Yeah, I can't find the hook. It's a bendy one. <laughs> okay, so I've got some adhesive lead foil here. So it's um, lead foil. It's got an adhesive back in now. Usually, I would um, cut this with a scalpel and a steel ruler and it'd have a nice neat strip. But that's difficult to do when I can't even see half my tools on my bench at the moment. So what I'm going to do is come in with my scissors and just trim it. Like so, and as a, as a, an aside, the, the backings come off it. So I've got my strip here, and then we can switch back to the other camera, and let's start putting this on. So I'm going to catch it with my thumbnail, uh, sorry, my fingernail, just in there, and I'm going to wrap that up the shank. Now, although I'm saying these these flies are for grailing, I mean, let's be honest here, they'll, they'll work for trout as well, you know, most of them, anyway. So, I'm going to catch, I've just started slightly up, and I want the weight to be towards the back of the hook. Starting to undo my own lead wraps there. There we go. Not the neatest, but it doesn't matter because we are going to cover it in thread. So again, I'm going to this time not be overly worried about how much super glue is going over this. Just it helps embed the fly in. And then Again, I'm, I'm still on the black nano silk. This one's at six aught. Yeah, so uh, I think this is the longest I've gone without fishing for about 20 years, I think. Uh, which is, God tough when you think about it but first world problems I suppose so I'm going to take that away I've got um, I've got the lead foil kind of wrapped it's not completely covered but we're going to come on to that a bit more now um, you'll need a bit of tippet material I'm using some uh, four pound uh, you can use whatever breaking strain you like obviously you don't want it too thick but if you get the four pound and you bring that up to the top here Catch it on again all the way down. Now, I used to not have much faith in shrimps, and I think it was because I was tying them far too heavily and they were big, chunky things which never really worked for me. Oh, there's, there's the box, 
It's a Hanak 330 barbless hook at 10. Um, so it never really worked for me. And um, you, when something's not working for you, you kind of, you, you lose faith, don't you? you you're like, Ugh, it's the, I'm, I'm not into this. It's, it's not working for me. So after that, they kind of, I've got them in my box, but I very rarely reach for them. And then just recently I started um, getting some joy with them. And what it was, was I'd seen um, some of the Czech guys who tie them really, really skinny. And I thought, oh, maybe maybe I've just uh, over-egged it a bit. So, sorry, while I've been whittling on, I forgot to mention, I'm using the... Uh, this is four millimeter fine stretch, and this one's cinnamon flavored. Uh, right, so next, as I was saying, yeah, I, I think I was overdressing the fly. So I've started to skinny them up a bit, and it has made a difference. Now, the dubbin is a combination. This is a Semplify's ice dubbin, and uh, it comes in a whole variety of flavors. But what I've done is I've mixed the pink and the what were they calling it? The fuchsia, if, I, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And what I've got is this. And what I'm going to do is catch in as thin a double noodle as I can create. Push that up. Now I've still got a bit in my hand, but I just want to see how much more I'll need. A lot. <laughs> yeah, I think grayling have, uh, because it was the first fish that I kind of targeted when I got into river fishing. It's kind of always been one of my favourites, really. I mean, I, I enjoy trout fishing, but grayling are a bit special. Some people might disagree, and they prefer the long summer months waiting on a trout rise. Uh, I don't mind a bit of that myself, but unfortunately I don't have a lot of it in close proximity. I'm hoping to get down to Wales a bit more this year. Uh, because they've got some fine fishing down there in the valleys. So I've got that in. It's not too thick. And what I'm going to do is bring over the shell back. Now this is one of the things I love about this uh, this trout line stuff. It, it stretches over and it stays in position. You know, you, there's not much fiddling with it. Once you've caught it in... I'm going to get two or three wraps and then what I'm going to do is stretch it back, get a couple of wraps in front and then I can simply come in with my scissors, take that away. And because I've got them wraps in front, the thread's not going to back up and release the shell. Then I can grab my clear rib here, just tip it. Cheapest rib you can buy in fly tank. And then I'll come up the back of the shrimp. And as I come up, my turns are getting a little bigger each time until I come into the head once more. Catch that in. And then I can take away the tippet material and then concentrate on building a nice head. Once I'm content, I've got what I need. I can whip finish. Just 
gonna take that loose thread away there and then I'm gonna use some UV varnish on this one you can use super glue or resin it doesn't matter uh, my question is is why can't all super glues for fly tying have brushes like this I mean Solaris has managed it but no we've got big stubby brushes in our super glue pain in the arse there we go Put that in. And then I'll just cure that off. So I've got lots of plans this year for trips and fishing videos and more time videos. And uh, I hope you'll stick around to, to sharing them. And there we have the shrimp. Now the last thing that I like to do is I've got a pair of pliers here and now I just come in and it's I'm not clamping down on it but I am just giving it a little squeeze and what that does is it just creates that thinner profile and it helps the shrimp sink. Shrimp sink. Shrimp. I'm a bit tongue tied there. Sink a little bit quicker. Okay, so I, I hope that was of some use to you, especially if you were looking to um, uh, have a look at the the shrimp patterns. Let's have a look. You got any recommendations for a good pedestal style vice that won't break the bank? Uh, vices are a, oh, they're a terrible thing. I mean, if you've got the opportunity, definitely go to the BFFI. Uh, you'll get to see every vice there is ever made. Um, you've got to buy the best you can afford, really, uh, or you'll, you'll end up, you know, spending good money over bad. Um, because what you'll find is soon enough, the vice you'll outgrow the vice. You know, it'll not be able to do what you want. So you'll end up upgrading, and then you'll be left with a vice that nobody will want to buy second hand because. It was a cheap vice to start with, if you like, but I'm trying to think. I had one a while back, which I thought was okay, but again, it didn't have the functionality, and I can't think of the name of the bloody thing. No, it's gone. Sorry. If I think of it, um, if you tap me up on PM on Facebook, I'll try and remember and uh, let you know. TMC dubbing needle is brilliant, but is mega expensive. Dylan, it's a needle. I, I mean, I used to, in fact, I've got one here. Let me show you this. Uh, somebody made this for me. Uh, it's just a handle with a needle in it. Uh, and the other one I made myself, which is uh, a deer antler and I've stuck a needle in it. I wouldn't be paying mega expensive for a dubbing needle, I'm afraid. Uh, I just don't see the point. It's, it, it's a bit like these bobbin holders. I don't know if uh, you, any of you caught the, the video I've done on about just getting started in fly tying. And the biggest con ever is is the bobbin holder. It's just a nonsense. People trying to sell these things as the, the emperor's new clothes, you know, it's saying that, oh, they're adjustable and they do this and they do that. They, they hold a bobbin a thread. That's all they do. Uh, here in the USA, we call that a scud. There is other bug called a sow bug. Sow bugs have a flat body shape. Scuds are more like your shrimp, except in natural colour. It's funny, um, Colin, the, the US have different terms. Like in the UK, we have a fly called the hopper, and it, it looks nothing like your hoppers, which look far more fabulous, I might add, but um, they're not the same fly. But we've got our little nuances and differences and uh ah, it's good i think it's good yep i've caught a few salmon myself john uh, bugging for for uh grayling i've never caught any salmon when i've actually meant to go salmon fishing and catch them but you know they come when they come good evening thomas <laughs> 
Scott, you've got to keep up your fatherly duties. Uh, there is a shrimp video on, and it, it's pretty much very similar to the one that you you see in the vice there. It's a similar sort of style. Yeah, it's a bit fancier, I think, if I recall. But uh, yeah, it is there. Now, I think time's starting to wear on. I'm not quite sure what the time is, actually. Oh, yeah, I've gone past an hour. Sorry, I've, I've waffled on that much. Let me just... Uh, uh, the Disco Shrimp, yep, very effective. Uh, I was introduced to that by Ben Bangham, and it's a, it's an amazing fly. He catches an awful lot of fish. Uh, Matthew, you're very welcome. Anvil, that's the vice I was thinking of, John. The Anvil vice, it won't break the bank. It's pretty solid. Uh, you know, you, you get what you pay for. The Stone Flow Peristals are good range from £120 up. Uh, I had the Transformer and I didn't like it. And I ended up getting rid of that fairly quickly, Steve. I don't know, I just couldn't get on with it. Where do you have the shrimp on your cast? Well, I only ever fish two flies when I'm Euro nymphing. Some people fish three and, and that's great. If it works for them, brilliant. I, I fish two flies and there's a couple of reasons for it. I, I think uh, I can control them better on the drift and... If I get into any kind of tangles, it's much easier to untangle it. Uh, less admin, if you like. And that comes from competition fishing. You know, you've, you've got to be utilising the maximum amount of time you can in your session. So being a, having your flies in the water fishing is much more important than having a fancy three-fly cast. Or, you know, it, it, and there's many much better anglers than me that use three flies uh, to much success. So, yeah, great. Personally, I bought a Renzetti saltwater vice. I had to save a few months, but it's well worth it. You know, Renzetti's probably the, the one of the very few vices I've not owned over the years. Um, the ones I've liked, I've kept. So I've still got, um, I'm using the FNF Talon at the moment, which uh, I really enjoy using. I've got the Jan Tavek, which I think is an amazing vice. And uh, my original uh, clamp vice, if you like, was a Scotty which never sees the light of day now unless I'm doing a video about vices and I drag it out of retirement. Whiskey's getting cold, sorry. Time for another one. There's always room for another vice on my shelf, Scott. Always. What's on top of your whiskey? Oh, it's it's just a it's a a, a slate slab. It was um, so I poured this before I started, and uh, what it does is it's not a whiskey tasting glass, but you know if you put a, a cover over your whiskey glass, it just keeps the aroma going. Uh, not that I'm taking much time to really enjoy it, but it, it, it is good for that. Kebabs here. Enjoy, heart attack in a bun. So, Ralph, that's a that's a great question, actually. So, two fly cast, how much distance? Now, for grailing, uh, I don't want to give too much away here, but my my uh, fly distance is a lot shorter than you would think. I would I would um, distance my flies anywhere between twelve inches and twenty four inches, so maybe two feet. But when I'm fishing for trout, uh, they'd be three feet apart, uh, and I'd have no worries with that. Ah, always enjoy a nice dram, Thomas. Scotty's an excellent vice. Um, they make fantastic vices, actually. They're, they're, they're really good quality, and they're, they're pretty reasonably priced, I suppose, in today's market. A good beginner fly. Well, Matthew, I think um, the the one I tied, I think it was second, was the was what I called the bread and butter or the waltz, the waltz worm. I don't think it gets any easier than that, to be perfectly honest. But if you if you go onto the channel, the main channel, and you look up bread and butterfly, 
that's it doesn't get any simpler you know if you're going to start uh, with river patterns anyway the bread and butter if you're going to if you're looking for a, a sort of lock style pattern to tie then i would suggest a cat's whisker is a good way good place to start i mean if you're starting out fly tying that the main thing guys is um is proportions if you get the proportions regardless of everything else the fly will look half decent if you know what i mean it'll be presentable to fish so proportions is really important and uh, less is more you know when we all start out we you know we're using half a tub of dubbing on one fly and it's not required less is more i'll be over to adair thomas i'm really looking forward to it uh, I'm going to lay off the, the, the pachin this year. I wasn't so clever on the Sunday and the flight back was um, not the best. It's the first time I've ever reached for the paper bag. Oh, you're very lucky having a fishery so close to you with a stamp of fish that Ned has in them lakes. Uh, I'm going to come armed this year. I didn't bring any fishing kit last year, but uh, this year... I'll be I'll be bringing a little box of flies. Steve, I'll be going, but I'll be going shopping. Uh, I, I think um, Steve's got someone for filming this year, so there's not much point in in double tapping. I think I'll just go and enjoy the the wares that the vendors have got to sell, and of course they'll have a fabulous array of excellent fly tires to 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 go and look at and. Uh, I think I could probably spend a whole day just watching them boys and girls. They're um, some stunning tyres up that row. Make sure you go and see them. <clears throat> Steve. Are you going yeah. uh, What's your favourite fly to tie? Matthew, I like tying. Although I've got very little use for them, uh, traditional lock wets. Uh, I just think it's great fun. It's very relaxing. Uh, have some music on, a little dram going in the back, and uh, just I haven't got very many feathers, and I might I might address that at the BFFI this year. Just pick up some some more feathers to tie them kind of flies. I really enjoy it. I just don't. They tend to go in a pot, and, and then I give them away or. You know, it, it seems such a shame, but I don't have much use for them, to be honest. I fish, my venues are Rutland and Grafham, Tubule, you know, all the sort of stocked rainbow waters um, and, and the wets. And I don't I don't really tie them on for them kind of fish. I hope that answers your question, pal. No worries, Thomas. Just come up and say hello, pal. Favourite river? Uh, it's. I've fished a lot of rivers now actually, but it's still got to be the Socha in Slovenia. In fact, uh, in my next life, I hope to come back as a Slovenian because the country's absolutely amazing. They've got. I think they've got more rivers than people there, and uh, the Socha's, the, the. I'd say the jewel in the crown, probably most anglers in Slovenia. I'll tell you there's much better rivers, but they're just not telling you because uh, the sort of ruined now with tourist fishing like myself. I'm probably to blame for a lot of it, to be perfectly honest, you know, making videos about fishing on the Socha and the scenery. I mean, if you've watched any of my videos on the Socha uh, and it doesn't make you want to go, then you're not really a fly fisherman is what I would say, you know. It's, it's a place of unbelievable beauty. I joined late, maybe missed this, but what size are you usually using for grailing flies? Paul, I, uh, I vary. Uh, if I want heavy flies, I'll use a, a 14. Maybe occasionally I'll drop down to a 12 if I need really heavy. But a lot of the time, certainly on the chalk streams, I'm using sort of 16 down to size 20s. That, that's my, my sort of go-to flies. for Because the, the rivers are generally really clear or they have been in years gone by not so much this year do you use a lot of deer hair for tying 
yep, I, I, I quite enjoy tying with deer hair. It's a bit messy and uh, I have only got a very small space. But I do fiddle with it occasionally. I, I quite enjoy it. Again, it's one of these things. It's When I started fishing, I used to fish a lot of um, deer hair muddlers. You know, peach, peach dabblers with deer hair heads. Uh, I, not that I tied them back then. You know, I would buy these flies from, well, John Norris, actually. I would, because uh, I was based, when I was in the army and I sort of started getting really into fly fishing, I was based in Newcastle or Ouston, which is just outside, and uh, I would drive over to John Norris and I would buy these flies, and they were all the rage, the peach muddlers and baby dolls and stuff like that. But then when uh, boobies came along, it kind of uh, negated the need to tie these traditional sort of flies. So I got into being very good at tying boobies. Uh, I, I've managed to up my game with the deer hair, but uh, it's still, it's more a fly tying exercise than it is me tying flies to go and catch fish. Uh, cheers, Dylan. Riverwise, where is on the 2024 wish list? Well, not so much a wish list, Dylan. I'm going to Michigan. I'm returning to the Pierre Marquette in March. And we're going to go and try and catch some steelhead, me and a few buddies. Uh, we I don't know if you caught the video previously about the king salmon. We went in October. We had an absolutely whale of a time. Uh, the king salmon, and pool for me, it was a bit too... I mean, it wasn't so much a challenge catching these fish. It was a challenge landing them because uh, you're, you're dealing with fish 25 to 30 pounds on nine weight fly rods so it was a bit of a challenge getting them in sometimes but actually hooking them was it wasn't really angling you know you, you hoid your fly in and generally eight times out of ten you would get a bite but the steelhead are a different beast altogether and uh, i'm really looking forward to that i'm told they attack the fly much more aggressively and uh yeah it's i'm quite excited about that trip I think are we nearly at the end? Be good to use that magic door. <sighs> uh, it's been broken for a wee while, John. I'm going to fix it this year, though, I hope. <laughs> right, guys, uh, I, ho I hope you've enjoyed the, the stream. I've kind of waffled on a bit longer than uh, I'd hoped. So thanks for tuning in. Uh, I really appreciate it. And I'll see you all in the next video.